All right, so here we go with our first MT225 video. The purpose of the videos I'm going to be posting a little bit later today is to give you a little bit of a chance to review method of joints, practice with some of the skills we haven't gotten a chance to practice with in class over the last week, and to give you a resource to call on so that you can uh, go back and work through the process by seeing me work out a few sample problems. I'm going to for simplicity, I'm going to put each video in a separate file, so it's not just one long video. And um, most of our work is going to be on, done on the document camera. That'll be our stand-in for our whiteboard. I'm going to try to keep everything on one sheet, but it's not a bad idea to pause the video as you need to copy down things or work it out on your own paper. So for our first problem here, we're going to use a simple three-member truss. So uh, something that looks sort of like this, kind of like the first problem we did in class with trusses a couple weeks ago. So we'll take a truss that looks something like this. It's a little three-member truss. Three joints here, A, B, and C. And we'll apply a load at C. Let's have a, uh, put a 10 kip load on there. Let's put some geometry on it. We'll make this thing 12 feet wide. And we'll locate that peak right here. That looks reasonably close to 10 feet away. So I'll make that 10 feet. And I think we'll make this thing six feet tall. So there we go. There's our problem. And what we want in the end is a table that tells us what these date of stress is, or what the load is, in each member, and whether it's in tension or compression. So we've got our load. And since this is in kips, we'll label the column kips. And then we're either going to have tension or compression. And since we've got three members here, we'll need three rows in the table. Labeling out the members, we have member A, B, member A, C, and member B, C. Now, for the purposes of practice in this problem, let's say we want to have three significant figures in our final answers. So that means through the calculation, we'll keep five significant figures. That way we'll keep all of our round off error down and digits that we're going to be getting rid of. So the way we start a method of joints problem is always to solve the external problem, to find the reactions at the supports. So to do that, we need to draw a free body diagram. And the free body diagram is going to be of the whole truss. So to draw that free body diagram, let me just label out or line out the area for our final answers here, try to keep everything separated. So we need a free body diagram for the truss. The free body diagram is the result of getting rid of the supports and replacing them with the forces that the supports supply. So a pinned support always supplies two reaction forces. And since we don't know what those are, we'll call them RAX, reaction at A in the X direction, and RAY, reaction at A in the Y direction. B is a roller support. Roller supports only apply a force perpendicular to the surface they're on we can assume the truss is sitting on a horizontal support, something on the ground, for example, or on top of a set of walls. We have our B, Y. We define our coordinate system, positive X to the right, positive Y up, and counterclockwise moments positive. And then we have our applied load, our 10 kips. So there's our free body diagram. I'm not going to draw the dimensions on there since it's close to the original drawing. 
we'll avoid cluttering things up there, but we'll uh, be able to see the distances we need when we need them. So for solving the external problem, this is a non-concurrent force problem, so we have three equations we can work with. The sum of forces in the x direction is zero, the sum of forces in the y direction is zero, and the sum of moments about a point is zero. So let's build up our sums. We have our sum of forces in the x direction. So looking through the truss for x direction forces, there's really only one, RAX. No other forces are in the x direction. So that's our x direction sum. We can do our sum of forces in the y direction. And there going through the force, we have through the forces in the truss, we've got RAX up. So that's R A, pardon me, R A Y up. So that's positive. We've got 10 kips down, so that's negative 10, plus R B Y. And then we have our sum of moments about a point. We have to pick a pivot point in order to find our sum of moments. And usually one of the supports will do fine for that. And uh, we'll pick point A as our pivot point. Point A is not a bad choice because the reaction forces, RAY and RAX, will have no moment since they're pushing right on that joint. The 10 kip force and RBY will both have moments since they are some distance away. Their lines of action are some distance away from that pivot point. So RAX and RAY, no moments about A. The 10 kip force has a moment about A. The line of action of that 10 kip force is 10 feet away from A. So we have 10 feet times 10 kips. That's 100 kip feet. Alone, that 10 kips would tend to rotate the whole truss clockwise around point A. Clockwise moments are negative by our coordinate system. So I have a negative 100 kip feet from, from the 10 kip force. RBY creates a moment. And be careful not to make the very common mistake here of just throwing RBY in. I see this happen all the time. People throw that RBY in and then go and solve the equation and say RBY is 100 and then end up with unreasonably large reaction forces. It's a good way to mess up the problem right from the beginning. This force has a moment that's not just the force alone, it's the force times the arm. The line of action of RBY is 12 feet away. So the moment contributed by RBY is 12 times whatever RBY is. And we've assumed RBY is pointing up, which is a fairly good assumption in this simple problem. RBY is pushing up. That would tend to create a, clockwise, a counterclockwise moment. Counterclockwise moments are positive. So we have plus 12 RBY. So there we've got our sum of forces and sum of moments. If this is in equilibrium, which we're assuming it is, then these sums must all equal zero. That tells us that our reaction in the x direction at A is zero. And that makes sense looking at the truss because we've got no sideways forces. All of our forces are either up or down. So we have no side loading. So RAX is zero. So we can note that up here, RAX is zero. The y direction, the best we can really do with our y direction equation, I'm going to shift the page up just a little bit here. The best we can really do with our y direction equation is just add that 10 kips to both sides and get a new equation that says RAY plus RBY equals 10 kips. Now all that's really saying is that we've got 10 kips pushing down, the total of the forces pushing up must equal 10 kips. And then we've got our moment equation, which we can solve pretty easily by adding 100 kips or 100 kip feet to both sides. That would be 12 RBY equals 100 kip feet. 
And that we can solve just by dividing both sides by 12. And RBY becomes 100 divided by 12. That's going to be 8.3333. So RBY. Eight point three 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 kips. Now, two things to note here: we've rounded off to five sig figs, knowing that in the end we need three, and the answer came out positive. That the answer came out positive means our assumed direction was correct. If the answer came out negative. All that means is our assumption was wrong. Doesn't necessarily mean up or down or left or right. It means opposite of whatever we assumed. So that came out positive. So we can write that up here. Our BY is 8.3333 kips. And now, we, now knowing that, we can go into our Y direction equation and say, well, RAY plus 8.3333 must equal 10. And we can solve that pretty easily by subtracting the 8.3333 from both sides. And there we get 1.6667. So RAY is 1.6667. Don't forget to round there. Kips also came out positive, meaning that our assumed direction was correct. So we have RAY is 1.6667 kips. So there's the external problem. So we've got the external problem solved. Always the first step in any trust problem, no matter what the method is, we always solve that external problem first. It's always a good idea too to pause at this point and look at the truss and see whether or not this is reasonable. So let's shift the page back down here and take a look at the problem and the answers that we've gotten for the supports. We've got 10 kips pushing down at the top. So the forces that we get out of our reaction should be pretty close to the same neighborhood as that 10 kips. We shouldn't be expecting something big like 100 kips or something like that as a reaction to that 10 kip force. That would only happen in very extreme situations. We should expect more load on B than A because that 10 kip force is pushing down closer to B than it is to A. And that's exactly what we see here in our answers. RBY, the force B has to push up with, is at 8.333 kips, while RAY is at 1.667. The farther away a support is from the applied load, the less force there will be on that at that reaction, at that support. All right, so there's our external problem. So I'll go ahead and shift that back up here. Good idea to pause there if you wanted to take a look at the details. So now we have the actual method of joints. Now next week we're gonna be looking at method of sections. Method of sections is another way of solving a truss and being able to fill in this table. The first step is the same. So you've really got to nail down getting your reaction forces right every time. So let's go ahead and do method of joints. In method of joints, we assume that if the whole structure is in equilibrium, then the every piece of that structure is in equilibrium, including the joints that make up the structure. So each joint, joint A, joint B, and joint C, the pins that hold the structure together have to be in equilibrium. So if we draw the forces that are acting on those joints, they must be in equilibrium. Now, because a joint is a single point, there's no moment. Every force acts on the same point. That's a concurrent force problem. So the most we can handle 
in solving a joint are two unknowns because we'll only have two equations. The sum of forces in the x direction is zero and the sum of forces in the y direction is zero. Also remember that when you have three joints, you're only gonna have to solve two of them. That third joint is, uh, is something you could use as a check. And that's true for any truss, we'll always have to solve one fewer joint than the ones we've got. So let's start with joint A. In looking at joint A, we wanna draw the free body diagram of joint A. So if we draw a little bubble around joint A, anything that touches or crosses that bubble must be accounted for. If we go down here to our free body diagram for the, for the external problem, we can see that we potentially had four forces acting at joint A, two from the truss members and two from the reaction forces. Now we found out that our X direction reaction was zero, but our Y direction reaction is 1.667 kips up. So if we draw the free body diagram of joint A, we can first draw the joint, which is just a dot, and then draw the forces that act on it. It's always easiest to draw the forces as if they're pulling on the joint. Even though RAY here really pushes up on the joint, we can treat that as a pull from above rather than a push from below. So we've got 1.6667 kips there. We have two forces due to members. And we usually have to guess what direction those forces are going to be in. In a simple truss, you can kind of reason out what direction the forces will be in. But as the trusses get more complex, it becomes harder to make that guess right the first time. So uh, at most, you'd have to guess. And uh, in this case, I'm gonna guess that the force due to member AB pulls joint A to the right. So I'm gonna call that the force due to member AB, FAB. Then I have to figure out what's going on with the last member here, with member AC. Member AC, I have to either say is pulling on joint A or pushing on joint A. And here it's important to make a guess that at least has a chance of working out. If I assumed that member AC was pulling on joint A, then I'd have a free body diagram that wouldn't possibly be able to be in equilibrium. There'd be no forces down or to the left to counteract the forces that are already here up and to the right. So I've got to assume that member AC pushes on joint A. So I'll call that the force due to member AC. So there I have my three forces acting at joint A because RAX was equal to zero. Don't need to count that in there. I do need a little bit of more information here. I need to know what angle member AC is at. And we can find that out pretty easily by going back to our drawing. This angle right there is going to be the same as this angle here. We have opposite angles here, vertical angles, and those two angles are the same. This angle right here is the same as this one right here. To figure out that angle, I have to treat this part of the truss is a triangle, is a right triangle, six feet high over a base of 10 feet. We can use the inverse tangent to figure out that angle, the inverse tangent of opposite over adjacent. So if I take six over 10 and take the inverse tangent, I get 30.964. So this is 30.964 degrees. I'll write that up here to 30.964 degrees. And again, keeping things to five sig figs, so we have three good sig figs we can rely on in the end.
All right, so we've got our free body diagram laid out for joint A. Let's do our sum of forces in the x direction and our sum of forces in the y direction. Now in the x direction, we've got all of FAB pulling to the right. So that goes into the x direction sum as FAB positive. We've got a piece of FAC pulling to the left. So we're gonna have a piece of FAC. The piece of FAC we've got will be the adjacent side. The adjacent side of FAC, if we treat FAC as the hypotenuse of a right triangle, the adjacent side is the X direction and adjacent goes with cosine. So we've got cosine of 30.964 degrees. Sum of forces in the y direction, we've got 1.6667 kips pushing up, but then we've got a piece of FAC pulling down. That would be the opposite side of that right triangle with FAC as the hypotenuse and opposite goes with sine. Now, because the joint is in equilibrium, the sums are both equal to zero. Now, the first equation, the x-direction equation, we really can't solve right now. We've got too many unknowns. But the second equation, we definitely can solve. So let's go and solve the y-direction equation. First, I would add FAC sine of 30.964 degrees to both sides. And that would give me 1.6667 equals FAC sine of 30.964 degrees. All that does is move the term to the other side. I like that over subtracting the 1.6667. Then I don't have to deal with as many negative signs. To get the FAC alone, we divide both sides by the sine of 30.964. And that'll give us a value for FAC. The signs cancel out there. So now I go to my calculator and I'll take um, 1.6667 and we'll divide it by the sine of 30.964. And that gives me 3.2395. That's KIPS. So that gives us something we can finally fill into our table. Member AC carries a load of 3.2395 KIPS. We'll wait a moment to figure out whether that's tension or compression. The thing to note here is that our answer came out positive, which means our assumed direction is correct. That member AC does push joint A away. Now that we know what FAC is, we can go to our, y direct, our X direction equation and take our values and plug them in, FAB minus FAC, 3.2395 times the cosine of 30.964 degrees equals zero. And if we crunch the numbers on that, 3.2395 times the cosine of 30.964, that gives us 2.7778. So we have FAB, minus 2.7778 equals zero. So obviously there, if we add 2.7778 to both sides, we'll get our value for FAB. Two point seven 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 eight kips. So we've got another value we can plug into our table, 2.7778 kips. Came out positive. So member AB really does pull on joint A. So now we have to be able to check the boxes here. 
whether we have tension or compression. And the picture I drew in class last week to help you distinguish between that is to think about your supports as pins on a wall or pins in a board. If you take a stretched out rubber band or a stretched out spring and hook that band or that spring around those joints or those pins, if that stretched out rubber band hangs on those joints, those joints will feel pulled inward. A stretched out spring or a stretched out rubber band will pull the supports inward. And what we're looking at with our free body diagram is the force on the support. So this is what tension looks like. Tension makes the supports feel a force inward toward the member. Now at any joint, we're looking at one end or the other of these. So it helps sometimes to sketch the joint or at least a zoomed in picture of what we have at that joint on top of our free body diagram. Here we have joint AB, or member AB. There's joint A, member AB is to the right of joint A, and FAB, which we've determined here is positive, so it is in the direction we've drawn it. That looks just like this. That's tension. Member AB is in tension. Now for member AC, the member is up and to the right compared to joint A. So the member is up here. like that. Here we have the opposite situation. Joint A is being pushed outward, pushed away from member AB. When that happens, we have a member that is in tension or in compression. When we have a member in compression, it pushes the joints away. Think about taking a compressed spring and wedging it in between two blocks those blocks are going to be pushed away. When we look at the forces on the supports, we're looking at essentially the reflection of that compression. So a compression force we like to think of as squeezing, but the thing that's actually doing the squeezing feels a force in the opposite direction. It's essentially Newton's third law. So that's what compression looks like. So compression forces the joints outward. That's exactly the picture we've got here for member AC. Joint A is being pushed outward. So member AC is in compression. So that's the analysis at joint A. To finish up, we have to move on to another joint. We've learned everything we possibly can about joint A. There are no mysteries anymore at joint A. We've got to move on to another joint. And we can either go to joint B or joint C. I would pick joint B primarily because we've at least got one of our, un one of our members at a horizontal. That means we don't have to take sines and cosines. If we picked joint C, we'd have two members. One of them we don't know. One of them has a blank line in the table at an angle. That means sines and cosines, more complex system of equations to solve there. So let's do our free body diagram at joint B. Now at joint B, there are three forces. There's the reaction force at B, and then our two member forces. So there's joint B. We've got our reaction at B, which was 8.3333 kips. up. Then we have our two member forces. Now member AB we know. Member AB, according to our table, is in tension. That means that it pulls the joints inward toward the member. Well, for joint B, the member is to the left. So the force from member AB, since AB is in tension, must also be to the left. So we have 2.7778 kips to the left. 
Those are known forces. There's no guesswork about our directions there. Those are known at this point. So the only force we don't know is the force due to member BC. The only direction that makes any sense with the two forces we've got here means that member BC has got to be pushing joint B down and to the right. And we're going to need an angle. And just like with joint A and the angle at A, we can figure out the angle at B by treating this portion of the truss as a right triangle six feet high over a base of two feet, 12 feet from A to B and then 10 feet from A to C on the horizontal. So it's got to be a two foot difference there. So if we go to our calculator and use the inverse tangent of six over two, we get 71.565 degrees. So 71.565, and again, looking at vertical angles, we're down here in our free body diagram, but we can find the angle from the geometry right there. Now notice there's only one unknown here. That means we only need one of the equations. We can either do our sum of forces in the x direction or our sum of forces in the y direction. Either one will work. And either one will give us a perfectly acceptable answer, although you might get slightly different answers due to round off error if you use uh, the X or the Y directions. I would go personally with the Y direction because this number, this 8.3333 kips, came from our reaction forces. The 2.7778 came not only from our reaction forces, but our analysis at A. Essentially, we had to solve two sets of equations to get 2.7778, where we only had to solve one set of equations to get 8.3333. So that means this 8.3333 is a little bit closer to the original exact information that we had. So there's a little less round off error involved with that 8.333. Now, in the end, we're going to round to three sig figs, so it doesn't make any difference. But just out of habit, I'm going to go with the one that's a little closer to the original information. So I'm going to pick the sum of forces in the y direction. You could certainly try it on your own, uh, solve the forces in the x direction, and see that you'll get substantially the same answer, definitely the same when you round it down to three sig figs. So let's take our sum of forces in the y direction. That means I've got an 8.3333 up, so that's positive, and then I've got a piece of FBC pulling down. That would be the opposite side, and the opposite side goes with sine. So we have sine of 71.565 degrees, and that's got to be equal to zero. And same as I did up here for my um, y direction equation, I'm going to add this whole thing to both sides. That'll give me 8.3333 equals FBC sine of 71.565 degrees, divide both sides by the sine, and go over to the calculator, 8.3333, divided by the sine of 71.565. There I get 8.7. eight, four, one, kips. So that came out positive. So we can fill it in our table. Seven, eight, four, one, kips. Came out positive, so our assumed direction here was correct. Looking at where the members are compared to where the forces are, member BC pushes down and to the right. Member BC is pushing joint B away. Here were, here were the two members. We had member AB and member BC. Member BC is pushing joint B away. Pushing away means compression. So member BC is in compression.
So let's finish up here by drawing a summary diagram. Now, unfortunately, I'm out of space here, so I'm going to have to go to another page. I'll put both this page, I'll put this page back up after the final solution, after the summary, if you need to get a good picture of it. So let's draw our force summary. So we start out our force summary diagram with a reasonably good sketch of the, of the original truss. Label the joints. Put our external forces on. We've got our 10 kips here. Put the reaction forces in. You don't have to put in any forces that are not that are zero. So I wouldn't put the RAX and then say it's zero. We've already got that taken care of. We had 1.6667 kips at A, and here's where we're gonna round off to our final number of sig figs. We'll round that off to three sig figs. So this is our presentation of our answers. And we decided at the beginning of the problem, we wanted three sig figs in our final answer. So three sig figs is what we'd round to. For B, we had 8.33 kips. Don't forget the units. And now we can fill in the individual members from our table. Member AB carries a load of 2.78 kips. And we determined that was intention. So we'll label that with a T. Member AC carried 3.24 kips, and we figured out that was in compression. And then member BC, that carries a load of 8.78 kips. Also in compression. So there we have at a glance, all of the information we just solved in the table that we had set up for the for the truss. So that's a good way to present your answers and make sure that you don't round off to those final number of sig figs until you're right at the end. So there's our force summary diagram and one more time the work supporting that.